It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Christine Bennett uh, as our plenary speaker for this session. Uh, James Downey this morning made some reference uh, to her illustrious career, so I will add some notes to that, but then give the floor to Christine. Christine is a specialist paediatrician and has over 30 years health, ex health industry experience in clinical care, strategic planning, business operations, and senior management in the public, private and not-for-profit sectors. Of particular relevance, uh, back in February 2008, which seems a long time ago now, Professor Bennett was appointed as chair of the National Health and Hospitals Reform Commission, providing advice on a long-term blueprint for the future of the Australian health system and aged care. The commission's final report was presented to government in June of 2009. Now, uh, 10 years on, with an election only days away, it's both timely and appropriate that uh, Professor Bennett reflects on where to from here and the journey of health reform. Uh, James Downey also this morning mentioned that IPA was constrained by caretaker conventions, but I'm sure Professor Bennett, to paraphrase uh, Sir Humphrey Appleby of Yes Minister fame, will give us a thought-provoking and courageous presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. And, uh, wow, what a big crowd there is here today. Beautiful out there in this beautiful, sunny Melbourne day, isn't it? Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I'm particularly pleased to be here because I actually gave one of these presentations uh, five years ago, which was halfway to this, the 10-year milestone, Glenn, of the National Health and Hospitals Reform Commission. And at that time, people kept saying, are we there yet? Is anything happening? We're not sure what's happening. And now, 10 years later, people are saying, oh, well, nothing happened. Uh, no, you know, nothing happened from it. No. In actual fact, a lot did happen. So one of my reasons today for taking the approach to this presentation I have is to take a very high level picture of across the whole continuum, from prevention to aged care and end of life. What did we say? What did happen? Where are we? And where are we going to? And I'll finish with a tiny touch on the two um, uh, parties that are contesting uh, for the federal parliament. Uh, at the end of the week. I will touch on those policies very, very briefly, but I'm going to finish with the my top 10 priorities. And I know we've got a very mixed audience, and I know that you've had a lot of deep diving into really important things that your, your lives and careers are committed and dedicated to. I'm hoping that through this expansive, almost speed dating across health reform, you will sort of see how what you're doing is, is fitting into the bigger picture. Right, now. Can we all, oh, by the way, how many people here contributed to the National Health and Hospitals Reform Commission work? You're all looking awfully young, to be honest, but a uh, <laughs> couple of grey haired people over there. Good, okay. Well, um, so just to cast our mind back to 2008, uh, and at the time, health was the electoral agenda, uh, on the electoral agenda. It was a headline every day. Safety issues in hospitals, pressures on public hospitals, costs out of control, chronic disease tsunami, frailty, age, ageing of the population, not to mention an incredibly fragmented uh, health system in financing and delivery terms, and of course, the massive blame game. So the community was completely confused. They knew things weren't going well, but they weren't sure who to blame or who to look to for answers. And it was one of the, uh, that incoming government under Kevin Rudd's key electoral platforms. Now, we were an independent commission. I just want to hasten to say that. There were 10 of us, none of whom were shrinking violets, let me tell you. But we took a view that we would not know as uh, the right answers without going to where no commission had gone before, really to the very front line of, the, the, of healthcare delivery and, in fact, to the community. So our approach, and that's why I'd hoped I'd get more hands, to be honest today, um, that there, was, there were literally tens of thousands of people involved. Oh, good, some shake nodding heads here. 
uh, there were 150 consultations during two national tours. We had 10,000 uh, commentary through the Your Health that we had. We commissioned reports. We had over 1,000 written submissions. So it was really the work of very many from across the country. And the amazing thing was just how common what people said. Everybody had the same issues. Everyone could eloquently describe what was wrong and some people could say how it should be, but very few people could say how it should get there. So that was the work of the Commission to synthesise that. And so today's presentation, I'm going to actually use our organising framework from that Commission uh, work because it does help tell the story. So we had four themes of reform. One was taking responsibility, so everybody's role in their own health care and the health care of the community. Connecting care, this complex continuum from beginning to end of life and across so many different settings of care. How do you get the right care, right place, right time, right price? You all know about that. Our first time every time. Facing inequities, we had a health system doing really well for most of the people a lot of the time, but there were people who were missing out. Uh, communities missing out. And driving quality performance. So this was where we were looking at how can we lift the quality, lift the productivity and do it smarter without the runaway costs that we had. So we had 123 recommendations and back at the time 108 were accepted, 14 noted and one rejected. Remind me later and I'll tell you the one that was rejected. <laughs> Got to keep you in suspense somehow. Okay, are we there yet? Five years later, we went through what was actually happening. And by that time, about 44 of the recommendations were being implemented in uh, 61 in part and 17 no action. So things were happening. Uh, but of course, changing political landscapes, changing commentary na narratives, uh, you know, it's often hard to put together where things are. So what I'm going to try and do is go through each of those four reform themes, say what we said, what happened, where we are now, and then we'll come to a little bit about the politics the, and then my top 10. So taking responsibility, as I said, was about individual and collective action by people, families, work uh, employers, health insurers, everybody really, about health and healthcare decisions. So this is the theme in which we discussed prevention. And how many of you remember the uh, Australian National Preventive Health Agency? in a blaze of glory briefly. Okay, I was chair of that council, but it was uh, there for three years and then abolished. Now, we were doing some great work in tobacco, alcohol and obesity, and late, later when we look at the uh, OECD health at a glance last year, we're actually doing well in tobacco, not so well in alcohol and obesity. We did some innovative things that government couldn't do, like buy out the advertising rights of the big sporting agencies uh, and codes by, by alcohol. And actually having a partnership with those big sporting codes to actually be an influence on, on responsible drinking. That didn't go down well. Anyway, we were abolished. What happened? <laughs> what happened? No one stood up for us, actually. Um, reduced uh, investment and a reduction in state coordination. One of the exciting things that was happening with that commission, uh, that agency was that so many of the states were working closely together and learning from each other. And we had toxic fat from Western Australia being shown on the East Coast and be the influence heading out west. So it was a, it was a time where prevention, it wasn't that this agency was everything, of course it wasn't, but it actually was giving that focus. Now, there has been 100 million, I found this, Health Innovation Fund for Prevention and Project and Trials announced um, just last year. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing what they're going to do. But with all great ideas and great investments, the thing is, how are they executed? By whom? Who's watching? Who's, who's actually making sure it's heading where we're supposed to be heading? And uh, the COAG just recently announced a national obesity strategy. I think that was in February or March this year. So very hot off the press. So good news, they've noticed that we're getting fatter and we're going to do something about it again. Now another one of our recommendations was about my communities, uh, healthy communities reports, which were geographical across a whole range of things, really usefully, useful for primary health organisations, for hospitals, for community groups. Um, unfortunately, they're closing the site down 
Uh, at the end of the partnership agreement in, in 2014, they just finished up, wrapped up, and it'll now move across to the AIHW. If you get in quickly before the end of June, you'll be able to see what's on there, and it's a very good source of information. And I'm hoping that the AIHW and, and the PHNs can actually keep that work going, because it does inform that local action which we saw as being uh, fundamental. And community engagement, engagement, we had the Healthy Kids, Healthy Communities, Healthy Workplace. Anyone remember that one? That was one of the, na na the national partnership agreements that was ceased. Healthy Australia goals didn't happen, but I like this new um, obesity coalition. Um, and carers and support, support really never got off the ground. So that is taking responsibility, theme one, how are we all going? Maybe we need a little stretch, we all good? Okay, moving on to our, oh, social determinants, sorry. We, we haven't done much on social determinants and health in all policies. Um, and I think that is something we've got to remember that health is about more than health care. And that if we leave out the social determinants, we're not really uh, working to the best interests of the health of the nation. And that does need to have a frame across all government policies. We are, however, signed up for the sustainable development goals. Let's see what we do about that. Now, the My Health record could have been 45 minutes on its own, um, but can I say that the concept of a person-controlled electronic health record was, still, was to me one of the most important things that we, um, that we recommended and that has been acted upon, along with activity-based funding, but we'll come there later. So the My Health record, the purpose of it was so that people had their own health information. This was not an electronic record that the health providers were supposed to rely on. It was supposed to be a person's record. Why should everybody else have your health information and you don't have your health information? How can you make informed decisions when you can't remember when that procedure happened or which drug you were allergic to? You know, you might have a box in the bottom of a cupboard somewhere with some bits of scraps of paper if you're lucky. But this was supposed to empower people in their health. And I think it still can. I think there is a, a huge platform and a huge opportunity here if we take the next steps uh, to make use of this. And these slides have been provided by the Australian Digital Health Agency to give you a bit of an update. But, um, and I'm not even going to go near opt-in, opt-out or any of that, uh, that debacle. I'm just going to say what has happened and where are we heading. So we haven't had a massive increase in the, in the number of people viewing uh, and dispensing records and prescriptions and it is turned on and it is happening. Now we have about 90%, I think on this one, 90% participation now. I can't get an actual number, that does inclu include children however. 80% of general practices are now registered but are they using it? Are they, if you go in, go, how many people here have a My Health record? Oh, that's so good. Okay, Has, how, how many people here use their health record? Good. How, how many people have a doctor who uses the health record? Yes, the crickets, crickets are chirping. This side of the room's doing really well. Okay, so, you know, it is going to get there, but we have to make sure that we, with the next steps, are about making that record more automated, try and um, myth bust some of the uh, commentary around the privacy and other issues. And I um, heard someone the other day saying, oh, I can't rely on what's in someone's health record because they might be masking it so I can't see it. And I said, well, do you think they're going to come in and tell you something that they don't want you to see? I mean, it's at least you can see that they're not telling you something. So you can have that conversation. Anyway, I still think it's one of the most important elements um, of our, our work and, and an opportunity that no other country has. So I'm looking forward to promoting that one. Okay, theme two, connecting care. So this is comprehensive care for people across their lifetimes. So everything from primary care through uh, specialised care. By the way, I don't call hospitals acute care because you get acute care in primary care, by the way. So I call it hospital care uh, and specialist care right through to subacute, end of life and, and uh, residential aged care. So I'm not going to cover it all because we won't have time, but primary health care is obviously one of the most important platforms that we uh, recommended uh, for strengthening. So we did have 
a notion about pr uh, comprehensive primary healthcare centres. A number of those were built uh, or refurbished under a GP super clinic, not necessarily the way we would have gone about doing it, but anyway, the program ceased. I've got no idea if anyone's evaluated. Does anyone know if that's been evaluated? I couldn't find anything. No, okay. Um, primary healthcare organisations, which were initially called Medicare Locals and are now called Primary Health Networks, again, an important opportunity, a platform of bringing together primary care so they can be at the table with the hospitals, public, private, aged care and other providers. So I, I think that is, again, in my top five of the things that have happened out of the Commission's work that I think is important. Now, our healthcare home concept, there's lots of definitions of healthcare home, but we really used it to say you're enrolled with a general practice and the way that general practice will be remunerated or, or receive payments will be different. And so there was a voluntary um, um, uh, enrolment of diabetes pilot does everyone remember that? It became a diabetes coordination of care. That wasn't what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be about trialling a different financing method. Uh, it sort of had some interesting outcomes, if anyone's read the McKinsey report. But now I'm excited to say that the GPP CCC, uh, which is one of the MBBS, MBS's um, uh, clinical com consultative committees, has come up with a notion that from next July next year, there would be payments for patient enrolment. And in the 2019 budget, just this last month, there is uh, some block grant funding for um, uh, GPs who enrol over 70 year olds. So I think that's the direction and, and frankly, the, the cancer um, strategy that Labor's been talking about, I think would be much better through a, a benefit style package rather than add more to an MBS item. Right, now this is when you guys come in because we devolved uh, the running of hospitals to local, uh, more local structures. That was the states that did that, which was in our report, but that really aided the implementation of the ABF, which we'll come back to. Subacute care, missing link, we called it, still missing. Um, there was a national partnership agreement that was actually creating some really good outcomes but got dropped off and end of life care um, similarly. Now, because I'm a paediatrician, I'm just going to say that finally, 10 years after the event, we have the Healthy, Save and Thriving strategic framework and an action plan as of two months ago, which actually follow the work that we, su we suggested and more. And I really hope that someone somewhere will be keeping an eye on this to see how it's implemented and how um, the outcomes go. Aged care. Now, I will just admit that I'm on the board of an aged care company and um, it is uh, obviously very important for all of us, for some of us even more importantly because we're only moments away. From that, I've always said, by the way, be very, very good to your children because they're not going to be choosing your nursing home, they're going to be your nursing home. Um, so a residential aged care, obviously, we've got a lot going on. The Productivity Commission bore out the recommendations that we put out, up, became living longer, living better, and now we've got the commission. Um, really important area of work. Now we're on to our third theme, guys. We all going okay out there? In facing inequities, we focused on Indigenous health, in uh, rural health, dental health, and mental health. Now, I can't go through all of them in detail. I will say that dental health, um, I still think we have a health system without teeth. There's a few hundred million here or there, and, and there are some announcements, um, labour announcements, and I think it's a really good thing when we, when we focus on our older Australians because some of the most moving things that we heard was when people said they, they can't eat, they, they're in pain. But I think one of the worst was when a woman said to me, I can't kiss my grandchildren because I know I have halitosis and there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, it really impacts people's life. So word there for, um, for dental health. And rural health, look, a lot is happening. I think there's a lot of good policy work um, happening there, particularly the regional hubs that'll get um, medicos to the bush and be able to complete their training there. 
But um, what I wanted to talk about, and I'm, I'm just going to say mental health, I had to put this slide in. I'm not going through it with you, but I'm really passionate about mental health and I'm excited to say I think that we now really have mental health on the agenda. If you look at all the reports that are being done uh, and the uh, College of Physicians, the AMA, but all have mental health in their policies. It's become destigmatised. It's now of time, but we've really got to get better financing model to support people in community-based care, and we re and that's where you guys also come in. Um, and we need to start to see some some action uh, and some outcomes. Aboriginal health. Now, I've I've added this. You're you're going to get these slides, so that's why I've put a bit of detail in them because I'm not sure how many of you keep wondering, I wonder how closing the gap's going. Um, but this is the report from, in fact, um, I think it's just last month or February this year, uh, for 2019. And it is time for us to uh, refresh that agreement and go into the next era of closing the gap. But there were seven targets. And of the seven targets, two are on track um, and five are not on track. So that doesn't mean that things haven't happened and it also is because the context has changed. So the life expectancy has improved in non-Indigenous people as well, so that changes the gap. Uh, so there have been some improvements, but uh, it's just something we must keep our eye on. And I think the next phase is going to be through a formal partnership that's going to be negotiated through this year for um, closing the gap refresh. So watch that space. I've popped in dis the National Disability Insurance Scheme as well because this was something we didn't get fully evolved at all in our report and I was so glad that the government took it up because it's an important and very innovative approach to a, a missing segment of, of health and care. Um, now, it's not to say it isn't a monstrous challenge as well, huge challenge and a lot happening. but. Uh, there's been a lot of participants who've now 700% uh, increase there um, in the newsletter. This was actually their April newsletter from this year. 700% increase in the numbers, but a third of them are first timers, and the estimates are lower than the Productivity Commission e Commission considered. So there is a concern that there's some 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 missing folk there, and the current activities. Are um, improving that early childhood intervention and the privacy and consent for participants. Does anyone here have a family member or involved in caring for, for people on the NDIS? It is, it is very, yeah, it's very complex. I've got a, a nephew with autism and it's, you've got to spend this money or you'll lose it. It's, it so I'm not saying there isn't room for improvement, but um, I think this pricing for value and the relationship with providers, uh, particularly uh, specialist networks, is very important <coughs> next steps. So good on them and keep going. Last theme. Right, we all seem to still be conscious out there, good. Uh, the last theme is driving quality performance. Now, um, I don't know who that is, could be Tiger Woods, but anyway, it's really getting that leadership and drive the systems, the enablers of a high quality, high pro productivity um, system. So our people, our resources and infrastructure and our evolving knowledge. I'm doing one slide on this. It was probably the area most contested during the Commission work because the very first thing was about leadership and governance and this Commonwealth state. Who thinks we've got better Commonwealth state workings? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the people in the know <laughs> who have direct Commonwealth state, I actually do think that it is better than it was, to be honest. And one of the reasons is because of all of you, there's a lot more transparency uh, as well. Um, the National Health Reform Agreement, of course, who knew, um, wasn't worth the paper it was written on. Um, it could be just dropped in midstream at the change of government. I honestly didn't know that, to be honest. Um, but And the national partnerships were um, dropped as well. But there was a resetting of that health reform agreement a number of things did survive. Um, we have the national registration body. We have you guys right there in the centre. Hooray. And um, we have the Quality Commission. We had 
the nipper. I think that's a great loss, to be honest. I think they were doing really good work in terms of um, their uh, reporting and and lifting the uh, the information, usable information, and commentating. Um, Health Workforce Australia gone, Prevention Agency gone. We the Medicare locals was was part of our um, architectural structural change, and I do think having primary health networks largely aligned to health service networks, uh, public health service networks is a great opportunity as well, and the devolving of the uh, networks to by the states. Here is ABF. So, you know, we started off, we said 40%, the then Prime Minister said 60%, and then it turned into 45% of growth going to 50% of growth, um, which of course means you never get to 50% if you're only doing 50% of growth. We hoped, and we, I still believe, that activity-based funding has brought greater transparency, has brought more information about what we're doing, and quite possibly bending the cost curve. You, you'll have mar way more informed views than I do, but I do think this is one of the elements that needs to be not just preserved, but actually improved and, um, and adapted. What I don't think is such a good idea, and I know we've now got 45% of growth with a cap, with no guarantee, um, but also we've got this shifting sands where there's sort of assumptions and then a back casting and it's all about what was the growth, etc. Um, I, I honestly think we should just be going to a percentage share, keep it simple and focus on what else um, activity-based funding can offer uh, and make it more sophisticated. Now, um, next generation Medicare, yeah, we were all Trekkies, by the way, you may have recognised that from the, um, our mission, um, our motto is go boldly. Um, but next generation Medicare is really what the MBS task force is trying to do. Uh, they've got 70 uh, clinical consultative committees. Yep, that must be tough. Uh, 5,700 items. Uh, and they are actually putting out some innovative ideas. There's been a few, I think, emergency department, ICU, urology, a bit of neuro. But I think the, the bulk of it's we're yet to see. Um, but I think this notion of packages for, uh, for registration of, uh, with your healthcare home voluntary registration with your primary care provider, I think is the direction it should be going in as well. Smart use of data, well, I spend about a third of my life on this with the digital health CRC, um, which I hope will be a, a, a real um, innovator in this space, but we still bl fly blind. You guys are probably the experts at using data in a constructive way, but there's still so much rich data out there that we're not harnessing, uh, and digital technologies, uh, we're only scratching the surface. Research, we've had the Mickey on and MRFF. So where are we now? Apparently we're getting silver uh, across the world, just as the, the latest Commonwealth Fund analysis. Still not doing well in equity there, right down at seven. Um, but health outcomes and care, and it's, we, do, we do reasonably well. And another way of looking at it is the um, OECD healthcare at a glance. Um, which I really like this one actually. I think it's a good way of um, showing that we've got uh, really doing quite well in a number of ways, but obesity and alcohol way down there. And I, yeah, prevention message coming through, I hope. <laughs> um, and uh, the, yeah, and this is a really worrying one. I don't know how I point at this, but right in the middle there, that that red one in the in the access is about the million more than a million people who don't access consultations because they can't afford to the out of pocket expenses, um, and we have a bit of a problem with um, antibiotics and COPD admissions. We we seem to admit them. Now the health system continues to be complex where we are right now. Uh, I don't think much has changed from the, our simplified health system diagram. That's who pays for it, by the way. At the end of the day, we all do one way or another. The Commonwealth and state, as the Commonwealth goes down, the state goes up. As the, it's an inverse. Uh, if you continued on from 2017, I think you would find, uh, you'd know better than I, but that, that it, they've started to come together, but maybe about to part a little bit more and the Commonwealth share go down. But um, you know better than I, but we need to watch that because um, I had another slide which I took out, but 
the, the states can't afford hospitals. They don't have progressive taxation. They don't have the, 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 um, the tax base to fund hospital growth alone. And by the way, another reason we uh, recommended activity-based funding was to make sure the Commonwealth had skin in the game so that they actually were motivated to make primary care and out-of-hospital care more effective to reduce hospital care. So I think it's an important one to watch. Now, you can all tell me whether this is right. This was the work of an MD student of mine uh, last year who wanted to understand whether this the activity-based funding was um, bending the cost curve. And of course, through those years, rules change and all sorts of things change. But I think you could look at that and say after that initial what looked like quite a steep uh, you know, bend, and it went up again a bit, but I think it's come down again a bit. So um, I think it's, it's doing, that it's only part of its job, by the way, activity-based funding, but I actually think it is. It could have been on that trajectory, the 2007 to 2010 trajectory, which would be heading straight up the page. So uh, I believe it's doing the right thing. And this is the example to show that the uh, own source funding of states doesn't support the rate of rise of hospital uh, cost growth. Now, out of pockets is interesting right now. There's a lot of discussion. There's a ministerial um, committee looking at it. I actually got a graph um, of where we were heading by international comparison, but it only goes to 2016 17, and so it looks pretty flat. But people are saying to me that the out of pocket costs are in fact going up. A uh, whole range of reasons for that, um, but uh, it's also impacting on, um, possibly because of, and also impacting on health insurance and also on um, public hospitals and who's coming into emergency departments. So important work to be done. Um, there's still no doubt that there's waste in the health system and that is not because people aren't trying, it's actually trying to understand it and address it. It's not bad management, it's, it's complexity. And uh, I think um, the Grattan Institute have got a different version of this. This is the one we did for the commission work. It shows, you know, we talk about ageing population. We've got the, the um, which is the black, black uh, part of the histogram. The population growth is the white part. The little dotted bit at the top is pricing increases. And that big grey bit is volume of care per case. So we do more to people. Does it make them any better? Not sure. Some of that will be technology costs, some of that will be consumer uh, expectation and defensive medicine, some of it will be duplication, uh, which is a waste, um, and some of it will be just because we haven't got them to the right place. They're wandering through the system using resource till they get to the right place. So a lot to be done there in how we can address um, rising healthcare costs. So another thing right now to say is I've largely focused on the public sector but actually two thirds of healthcare is delivered in the private sector, including in our community based private sector. And so I'm just gonna say the words Medicare Select because I still think it's worth looking at um, uh, for a long-term strategy, but we can't ignore the private sector in the work we do. Okay, federal health policy, here we are. This is the federal health policy. So it's actually quite an interesting diagram um, if you want to have a look at it. I've, I've tried many times to get a simple diagram, but um, speaking of which, changing political landscape. Okay, I could have had a lot more. I just thought I'd just do some of my favorites. Um, okay, so my message here is the changing political landscape and I have to say changing bureaucracy, and I know we've got a lot of bureaucrats here. I was a bureaucrat, good on you, you're doing an important job. But a, a Westminster style, and we need that in a, in a flourishing democracy, right? Um, you need that Westminster style, looking after your minister, looking after your government, trying to get them to do the right thing where you can. Um, but at the end of the day, that's your role. And that's one of the reasons I feel we have an issue with the durability of reform, because you get a good thing that's so that an expert group's worked on, that expert group's not involved in their, the continuation of it. It's handed over to people who've got good intention, who start to do things, who's monitoring, who's evaluating, who's making the adjustments. Now you guys in the IPA ABF world have that, although you lost NIPA as well, which I think was important. Um, but I just 
point that out because I think it's it's real it's a really important issue because health reform's a long game, right? It's a long game. It's not a short electoral cycle game. Now, what are our two parties saying at the moment? And these were the summaries. It's actually quite hard to get detailed, to be honest, but we've got the cancer, the cancer out of pockets idea, um, which uh, then the Liberals agreed they would do that too. Um, then there was the Liberals uh, actually, I think, said they would lift the freeze on Medicare, so Labor said they'd do that too. Um, L Labor has said that the, there'll be a dental plan, and there is actually now announcements of, of de well, there have been some announcements, 100 million um, dental from um, Liberals as well. Um, I think the two most distinguishing features that I could see was this notion of an Australian Health Reform Commission, which is something I'm going to finish on because it's something I've been talking about for a long time. Um, and uh, not necessarily exactly what I'm thinking, but the notion is similar. And um, the, I think, exciting idea of the funding that goes to primary health care for an enrolled population starting with the over 70s, which is in the budget and um, is, a, is a first step in that direction. So, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't give you any hints as to how to vote um, uh, on Saturday, um, but uh, whoever, whoever is in office, and I'm a non-partisan person, by the way, um, I think we'd all just want to work with them to get the very best health uh, policies and outcomes and not throw away things that are working um, for the sake of change. So here's my top 10 and then I'm finishing. Um, you probably guessed I really am into prevention and I'd really like, as well as the, the obesity um, challenge and the healthy children challenge, I'd like some other healthy Australia goals that we can as a nation embrace and see how we're going and track. And I really think a prevention agency that helps glue things together, it's not the the all and end all, but it can do things differently, is worthwhile. The personal health record, as I say, I think is a unique potential opportunity. It's not there yet, but hang in there. You tell your doctor to use it and we'll see how we go. Uh, Activity-based funding, definitely one of my priorities, but I just really would like it to be simplified. I think there's just so much work going on to, you know, fiddle faddles and, you know, negotiations and we'd just be good to put the energy into actually making it better and getting into that um, out, of, out of hospital admission space as well. Um, Value-based care, I'm sure you've heard a lot of it, uh, but I just put in my personal favourite idea, which is really linking primary health networks with health services and aged care. There's about 10, 12%, depending how you look at it, of our hospital beds have people in them who should be in another environment and are over 75. So that's one of the priority areas to get value. Um, healthcare homes, I've spoken about several times. Here's one wildly out from, from left field. Personalised medicine and genomics is going to change things, is already changing things, and we haven't, we're just not focusing on it. It's kind of too high tech and too complex, but it will change um, not only uh, how we practice medicine and healthcare, but how people approach their own healthcare over time. Digital health, we can't block fly blind, and uh, you know, at, at AI, will it, will it replace doctors? I have a great mug that says, don't confuse your Google search with my medical degree. So I still believe that, um, I still believe that, but having said that, there's a lot that we don't know that we don't know that we could know if we looked at the data. Um, I think climate change and health, I've got on my top 10, because it says emerging and evolving and um, part of us being responsible citizens as well. Um, the uh, health system sustainability with the private sector, now, durability of reform. Okay, so I would like to see an independent, appointed by COAG, but independent group of experts. So this will be health systems experts, clinical expertise, consumer and community expertise, and economics and data analytics people who are appointed by COAG, nonpartisan, resilient organisation that can't be sort of whisked off at, a, at an election without some uh, noticeable um, community reaction. I'm sort of describing it as like a combo of the Productivity Commission, 
that can do deep dives into specific issues and pull in the expertise. And I think they do a really good job, actually. But with Reserve Bank, who've got a kind of a watchdog looking at the levers, commentating on it, making, you know, setting guidance, along with OECD, that's got, a, again, an observatory, you know, what's best practice, what's happening elsewhere. And I think that's what I would like to see for this commission. So a number of the things that I've touched on today, like the obesity strategy, the mental health investment strategy, the um, what's going to happen with the Royal Commission on Aged Care. Uh, there's so many of those things, a healthy start to life. Who, where is monitoring that? Now, I know AIHW does great work and we should harness that work into this entity. Um, I think similarly, the Equality Commission, um, yourselves, there are a lot of groups who could contribute to this work. It shouldn't be done as an island over here, as secret, secret squirrel stuff. It should be an engaged, and it should engage with um, the health departments of Commonwealth and states, because again, you need to have those people on the journey of the thinking if they're going to be the ones implementing. I'm not suggesting these people are doers or even deciders. I think they're people who this group would be about guidance, advice, um, commentating and transparency so the Australian people can see what's happening. And we're not afraid to change direction in our policy and our reforms because we're working on the evidence and we're trying to make it better, not blame this party or that party for something that failed. So to me, it's one of the secrets to um, durability in reform, um, which uh, is my particular focus right now. And um, I thank you all for the work that you do, because you're beavering away doing the best you can to get the best health uh, value and health care for our citizens. Um, I've left you with some references and open for questions now. Christine, uh, thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Um, we'll have some microphones around the room. Uh, I don't have any questions as yet on my app. Now, whether my app's not working, uh, I'm not quite sure. But uh, perhaps while we're getting some questions from the floor, can you tell us the recommendation which was rejected? Oh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, we recommended an Aboriginal health um, purchasing uh, agency similar to DVA for uh, enrolled uh, Indigenous people, not to create a separate healthcare system, but to have more um, smart purchasing that could also purchase for uh, cultural safety and, um, and to enhance the, the mainstream health services in terms of their responsiveness to Aboriginal people. So I think that it was misunderstood, personally. I don't know. I actually th still think it's a really good idea. Um, and it would be something, obviously, that would need to be worked through with uh, Aboriginal um, uh, communities and representatives as well. But the idea was that they would be um, a, a focus. And someone said to me once, well, you know, that makes them special and you're trying to invest more in them. And I said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but we want to do it well. We want to do it well. So that was the one that was rejected. Well, it wasn't actually rejected. It was, I think it was uh, something like will be considered or noted or some sort of thing that didn't mean supported. Uh, questions? I'm sorry, I've swamped you with so much detail, I know. But, um, oh, someone brave up the bat. Is that on? No, oh, it is on. A uh, comment and a question, if I may. Um, first comment is the uh, long-term projections, um, which was done by John Goss for the Reform Commission. I think a lot of the thinking around that um, has moved on from just demographic and disease prevalence and we're seeing a lot more work showing that income, whether that's national income or individual income, is much more of a significant driver of health expenditure. Uh, so I think we need to become a little bit more nuanced beyond the traditional demographic and disease. Just a comment, gratuitous one at that. Um, in terms of a question, uh, your first priority was that health is, health is beyond the health sector. So then should the membership of the Reform Commission, if it does get up, be beyond the health sector? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it should. Um, that's why I suppose I said community. Uh, but you don't want to create a behemoth either. So 
it may be that um, that would be one of the deep dive areas and you'd be involving agencies in, in that. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm seeing this Health Commission as being a health care, health system commission, but uh, I 100% agree with you. It's a really interesting point you made the first one too, because I suppose you're saying prosperity means we can afford more, um, but at the same time, um, we, we know that the numbers of people who are not uh, seeking care because if they can't afford it is, is going up too. So what, what's, what's going on there? Don't know. It's a bit of a mystery really. The bulk billing rates have gone up um, from 82% to 86% uh, at the same time as out of pockets are going up. So mm, interesting. But there, thank you for that, and um, I think I do think the social determinants work. That is, that needs a whole set of expertise in itself. But as a paediatrician, I can say the most important investment I think is in early childhood education. So you probably wouldn't have expected that, but that's what I think there. Mm. My uh, app has uh, sprung to life, and I have a question from Sophie Scott. If oh. you had to uh, prioritise actions for the future when it comes comes to healthcare, what would your top priority be? <laughs> Thanks, Sophie, wherever you are out there. Hello. Um, top priority. Oh, look, um, look I, I, I don't want to go with the Commission because the Commission is sort of a structural thing. So in terms of dynamics, I, I still think uh, that we're in a data-rich environment um, and that people and clinicians uh, look, you know, it, we're getting more and more complex. So I suppose I, I really, I can tell, you can tell by what I'm actually doing in my day jobs, to be honest. Um, uh, I'm actually on the board of an aged care company because I think that's a really important sector. And I'm involved with the Digital Health CRC to get better use of data and digi digital technology that enables rather than, um, than you know, wastes uh, investment. So I, I, I really would like the personal controlled electronic health record to work. I think that would really transform how we interact, uh, you know, health system interacts with people. And I think as the younger generation comes through, they're going to want and expect that data. And I think it'll change how, um, how that whole get the right care, right place, right time might work much better. So if I had to go with one, I might, I might go with that. I don't want to go with one though, Sophie. I want to go for at least five. Yep. Uh, there's a question over here and then down the front. Thanks. Um, you mentioned a couple of times the recommendation around the medical home or the healthcare home. Um, given that the Commonwealth, well, one of the election commitments is for an expansion of that for the over 70s. What do you think have been the impediments to that being a success so far and how would they translate that into becoming a success? Look, actually I was just speaking to um, the chair of the GPPCCC uh, about this um, uh, recently because the, the, you know, language is important and definitions are important. So healthcare home came to mean that you get a bundled payment out and, and, and MBS is rolled into that. Our notion wasn't that. Our notion was you find new financing mechanisms for the, for the voluntary enrolled people in a primary care provider that they're enrolled with, which is what's now happening. So um, I think that as with a lot of change, it does take time. I think that the, um, the voluntary enrolment of diabetes trial actually had for the right level of risk patient actually had an improved outcome but it wasn't cost effective but there were reasons I think that it wasn't cost effective so we have to trial these things pilot these things and I think that over 70s group is a really good group to pilot it in I wondered about um, children because we're used to having our you know our blue book our health record we're used to having a, a, a GP for our children um, or mental health is, would be another really, I think, interesting one because you're wanting to get that community nexus as where the financing will be directed and, and, and the care managed. So, um, so in terms of impediments, I think we, we don't really have the leadership to, to uh, make it happen and the finances are very um, 
I suppose they're probably scary, to be honest, to, to Treasury because it's if you do it on the MBS, you're doing it almost on a blank checkbook. If you do it through bundled payments, then you need to have some sort of uh, really excellent actuaries working on, on it to work out what those sort of benefit caps would be. So, um, and I think it takes time as well. So I think, I think actually there's, it's inching toward that happening and I think this will be a very important, important pilot. Mm. And, and by the way, I hope that by getting that bundled payment, they can maybe use uh, telehealth technology, do things differently without it having to be all fee for service um, based. Because at the end of the day, general practices are businesses and they do have to survive. So um, it's, it's important that whatever financing mechanisms recognise that uh, as well. Um, I have another question here while the mic comes uh, down the front, if we could. This is from uh, Andy Yang. Which, uh, what particular challenge uh, did you think was there in the health reform journey? How have we addressed it and what sort of lessons have we learned? What sort of challenge? Um, look, I think uh, at the time, the big challenge everyone was talking about was the Commonwealth state relations and the sort of blame back game and the fact that we, there was no, no opportunity to, to work with any accord um, across this very complex system. So uh, there was almost perverse incentives happening. And um, although I still very complex, clearly, I sort of am in agreement with the few people who put their hand up to say I think there is more dialogue, more constructive dialogue now between Commonwealth and states and I do think that's because the uh, health agreements um, are more explicit and again the hospital funding through ABF helps take some of the pressure out of negotiating a, a, a black box grant. Um, so I think that that complexity is was one of the big challenges. W there was no silver bullet, it's still there to stay. Um, but I think we're getting better at it. And um, in terms of since the Reform Commission, to me, one of the issues, is, as, I've, as I've said in my um, several times in the presentation, one of the big issues to me is you get 10 people and 30 support staff and 10,000 people contributing to a whole lot of thinking with a lot of ideas and even had a whole section on implementation. And it's thank you very much. Um, and handed over to people who weren't involved in the process, may have even been slightly threatened or hostile by the, uh, with, for the process, not really sure, and people who've done their very best to implement things, not being very clear about what was to happen, and not with great um, uh, monitoring of how it's going and the agility to change and shift along the way. So that's why I feel that if you know, we keep doing wonderful things and then they disappear into the ether, we have to keep our eye on the ball and, um, and, and focus our energies on, on the outcome, not just doing good things. Did it work? Time for one last question. Okay, thanks, uh, Christine. Uh, fantastic uh, to see those reflections on what was a really terrific sort of landmark in um, sort of advice on healthcare reform in Australia. So uh, my um, question is, one of, your, uh, one of the key recommendations of the Commission on the structure of the Australian health system was around the Medicare local structure, dealing with primary care issues yes. and, the, uh, and the local health network or local hospital network. I, I, I wonder if you could reflect about what might be in the future about perhaps bringing those streams of primary care and uh, the secondary care systems and tertiary care systems a bit better together. And uh, perhaps in the future, do we need to also think about what structures locally should be there for aged care as well? Because that seems to be sort of something that's missing in the equation. Thanks, Jim. Um, you, you must dream about health reform like I still do. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's probably a, a diagnostic code for that. Um, but. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I mean, as I said earlier, I think that triumvirate of primary care, hospitals and aged care, and then there's a number of other community-based services, but I'm including them in primary health care, uh, is, is, is really critical. And mental health is another one which you may not think of in that in immediate space. Um, 
the primary health networks, I think they had a little, a little hiccup when they went from Medicare locals to primary health networks. I don't think that was a bad thing in a sense that we actually got more alignment. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case in every state, but certainly in New South Wales we got more alignment. Um, and it probably wasn't quite as diffuse an effort. Um, so, But it did take the wind out of the sail for a number of groups who were doing great things with their Medicare locals. And I think they've picked up again since then. So I think it does give that opportunity um, to glue the, the primary health groups together, come to the table with the hospitals. I would have aged care providers in there from the get-go. Um, and, uh, and using those healthy community reports that I mentioned are, are not there anymore. Um, um, you know, really understand your local community where the gaps are and work with them. Some of the greatest innovation that we saw were actually where hospitals, uh, usually championed by individual clinicians or teams, went out to the aged care providers, brought in the primary health care providers and worked out the protocols for when are, and, and ambulance for that matter, when are we going to bring someone in, how can we manage it here, Get, you know, the outreach into the, the aged care facilities, supporting the development of skills in aged care facilities, which, by the way, is a subacute care environment that's home for those people. So um, I don't know if I'm answering your question or just furiously agreeing with your commentary, um, but uh, I think it, 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 it is one of the big opportunities that we have going forward to do more with the primary health networks and hospitals and aged care. And I will just say, um, Glenn, that um, the, this, this is a work in progress. Um, you're getting the first sneak preview of what will be a report coming out in the second half of the year. That'll be it, guys. That'll be 10 years and then um, passing the baton. But I just feel in the absence of a permanent health and a reform commission, it's a useful thing to have commentary across um, the whole spectrum of what's being done to give Australians the very best health that they can and health care that they can in an equitable way. So um, you may see that later in the year we'll bring out a report which will be called Where To From Here? Okay, thank you very much. I think that's it.